Hey y'all, Andrew Reed with Mossy Creek Mushrooms. And uh, with me today, as ever, is my ever lovely wife, Samantha. <laughs> Hi. Hi. And then joining us today is Josiah from ET. Fun guy. Hey, hey guys. Hey. <laughs> Sorry, well, you distracted yeah. me. I didn't, you were like. <laughs> yeah, I think my uh, computer's volume was on, and I had a. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll fix that. Crap! I need to. Yeah, I need to put my volume down too on the phone. There we go. I just wanted to remind everyone. So. Hey, Thank you. how's it going, guys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, another mushroom farm start. Exactly. Well, you know. Well, we did talk about him and Han, and don't worry, guys. It's just a plug. It's just a plug. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Samantha's face. Oh, man. All right, y'all. Well, today we were wanting to discuss mushroom myths. And I really just said mushroom myths to Josiah and Samantha and then left it at that. None of us have discussed this with each other beforehand, really. So, Oh, and it's going to show. It's going to show, <laughs> yeah. It's absolutely going to show. Because uh. I, I am nothing. If not, uh, well, ad hoc. So, Samantha. You do it well. Thank you. <laughs> I do work on the fly a little better than most, I think. But, oh, man, look at that. We got Mondo with us. Oh, Samantha's already on the chat. Dang, got us covered. Yeah. There we go. What's well, going on, Mondo? Hi, Mondo. <laughs> um, all right, Samantha, since you're going to have to leave before us, right, what's your favorite mushroom myth? You always put me on the spot, and I've got like ten minutes. Um, well, that's why I was putting you on the spot. Uh, I'll give you a second, Josiah. <laughs> favorite mushroom myths. Uh, all right, I'm going to embarrass myself and show that I took this in a whole different way um, than them, and I'd rather actually just show you guys my favorite mushroom myth. You want to show it? Oh, show you guys. Oh, look at that. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> Props. He can't, he can't. <laughs> uh, so uh, rather than mushroom misconceptions or uh, going that route, I literally went with uh, mushroom myths. And like, like a literal mythology. Like mythology. Like, uh, <laughs> and that's just, uh, I was drawn straight to the Christmas myth, obviously. And yeah. uh, this is one of the more popular ones. I'm probably just going to repeat to a lot of people here that know mushroom stuff. But yeah. man, Start with the colors of Christmas, red, white, and green. Oh, get yeah. Amanita muscaria mushrooms growing under the conifer trees. Um, you know, there's the, the use of these mushrooms throughout a lot of ancient cultures, but in Siberia, I guess the story goes that you have the shamans that would collect these mushrooms and then hang them to dry. Mm. So they're commonly, they're, uh, they're poisonous, right? You, right. Eat, you pick these and you eat them, they're poisonous. Something I read in... Uh, radical mycology is that it's actually like you I, there's ways that people it's just using them wrong you dry them out is one of them so these shamans right. would hang them from the tree to dry out hence and now you christmas get ornaments, christmas please. ornaments <laughs> okay so the next part these shamans also go around delivering these on the winter solti solstice sorry this is uh december 21st Siberia, snow like crazy. Right. Snow's covering the doorways to most people's houses, so they drop them through the chimney, through the smokestacks. So that's the idea. I also was wondering if, like, the stockings over the chimney is a place where you'd hang them to dry as well. That kind of makes a little bit of sense to me because you have a little bit of heat drying. Yeah. And I think uh, the toxin is actually heat de degraded. It's thermo. Oh, crap, I forgot. <laughs> Phobic. There you go. It degrades under heat. So maybe yeah. maybe hanging them above the fireplace was a good, you know, yeah. good way to dry them out. So uh, also the people delivering them, the shamans, dressed in red and white hmm. clothing, you know, wearing these hats supposedly. Uh, and I guess really like the last one, so their um, reindeer are known to eat. Amanita muscaria. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So they'll eat it. And uh, one of the things I read in uh, Radical Mycology as well was that, uh, you know, shamanic use of this involves <laughs> actually drinking the urine of someone that's digested it. And that's another way so, that it filters out. I've heard it's either the urine of the shaman or the urine of 
the reindeer. The reindeer. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. So they use them as like a filter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> filter. And well, so here, if it's the reindeer, then you think about Rudolph, the red nosed reindeer leading you on some sort of a journey. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah I got you. <laughs> and if you're seeing flying reindeer, I mean, that's just yeah, kind of the icing on the cake Kind of, there. kind of fits in. It fits in. Well, that makes sense to me. I mean, probably not Rudolph. <laughs> Dude, I, he was like a 1950s thing, but uh, maybe I don't know. But I do get the other reindeer. Like, what was how many? How many reindeer are there? Seven. Man, I don't know. I think there's seven. I think so. Prancer, yeah. Dasher, Dude. Oh my gosh, I can't remember the last two. If there are seven, so it doesn't matter. It make that I've I've always see I've heard um, a mixture of this okay. with mixed in with Norse mythology. Yeah, that Odin was Santa. And Odin rides a seven-legged horse. I mean, eight-legged horse. Eight-legged horse. That's what it is. It's an eight-legged horse because they have two pairs, or there's multiple pairs, and there's eight reindeer. And then something about Odin being, you know, dressing in red and white, and I don't even remember all of it now, but there's there's a lot of mythology that seems like oh, wrapped yeah. up around like that. Oh, yeah, all kinds around Christmas. That's <laughs> <laughs> That one's awesome, though. Well, Christmas is a good one. So, you know, plus I like deep winter. It's a time for... It kind of makes sense to me that, that you would, if you're going to take mushrooms as a people, you would all do it around Christmas time, whenever it's dark outside and you don't really have much else to do other than introspection. You're literally snowed into your little hut there. Right. <laughs> yeah. And there you go. All right, Samantha. I didn't know about all this awesome, fantastical stuff. You didn't? No, I did not. Well, <laughs> but now I do. So I will I will say that I would... Interesting. I do want to get to John... Uh, was it John? No, Scott Stevens said mushrooms are space aliens. And That's then... a very interesting one. Oh, yeah. The, um, what, what do they call that? Uh, pan... Panspermia. Panspermia. Yeah. yeah. And then, the, which is where you talked about... Uh, I can your, dig that yeah. one, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then... Uh, was it John said mushrooms grow in dark caves and don't respond to light? Yeah, yeah every day at the farmer's market. That's a good one. Oh, yeah. Well, and, and I, um, I've got friends who are computer programmers, friends that are engineers. They both have the same joke. Engineers are treated like mushrooms, were fed shit and kept in the dark. And I'm like, that's only <laughs> one type of mushroom, yeah, you know. Yeah. Or, but um, let's see. I'm trying to get these buttons down. So if you guys see like a flash of one person and then, you know, it quickly goes to another, that's because I hit the wrong button. And I'm still trying to learn how to do this while looking at everyone else. We'll forgive you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> All right. Uh, Samantha, now I'm putting you back on the spot. Maybe that all mushrooms are poisonous. Into the mic, please. Maybe that all mushrooms are poisonous or toxic. Okay. That's, uh, that's something that I would always get at the farmer's market. You know, are these edible? Are these poisonous? No, I, I wouldn't be. You know, we wouldn't be here. <laughs> we wouldn't be selling them. Yeah. <laughs> Are these real? <laughs> well, then, then then you go, how do you know they're not poisonous? <laughs> <laughs> Let's see and find out. Come on. <laughs> you Did you get taste? that one, Josiah? I actually had a couple people come to the farm today to pick up grow kits um, for the special thing, and I was showing them around. And this one lady that was just, she couldn't believe it. And she asked, I think, five times, like, so everything you grow here is edible. <laughs> Every time you saw a different mushroom, you'd open this side of the grow room, and it was like, these are, these are all edible? <laughs> you sure? <laughs> yeah. Well, and that they're, that they're all psychedelic. Right. Um, it's kind of like this, this Alice in Wonderland. I don't know. It's just, <laughs> it's an assumption that is very common. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. The Amanita muscaria is that most common mushroom that's kind of seared into people's memory. So yeah, I, mean, I mean, even the toadstool, it has its right. own like name and Mario you know. mushroom. The yeah, I mean like even when when kids doodle mushrooms, what do they doodle? They doodle the Amanita yeah. muscaria, yeah. And that is associated often with being poisonous. And yeah. there we go. And that's, and hallucinogenic at the same time. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Have you have you tried that one? No, I haven't. No. Okay. No, I mean, <laughs> I, I want to. I yeah, that's what I, mean, I was gonna I say. I'm interested in it, but that's a uh, <laughs> the way in which you. I don't have a reindeer. I, I feel right, like that's yeah. when you need uh, you need someone to show you how to do that. I, I think I I agree with you. I'd yeah. rather do it with someone who's experienced than than not. Something else that so, kind of reminds me is you know um, into the microphone. I had a great grandmother that mentioned that. Um, fairy rings in the yard were like portals to different worlds kind of thing. Well, uh, I believe that myth. <laughs> so, I mean, just, 
I mean, and she always had this, you know, folklore and I fairies like that, yeah. and you know, uh, the Nisa gnomes and everything. Like it was a big part of her kind of bedtime stories that she'd tell at night and have you scared to death to go outside <laughs> you know, in the dark. <laughs> I, I get you. Growing up, we had uh, my brother, cousins, etc., and I would always we we grew up on the same land, right? So we would find puffballs in their dried out state and throw them at each other. And of course, like we had family. I don't remember if it was, I don't think it was my mother, but grandmother or maybe like Gigi, my great grandmother or something like that. But like there were people always telling us like, don't do that. You'll go blind. The spores will make you go blind, you know? So <coughs> yeah, excuse me. I remember <coughs> kicking those as a little girl and just having absolute. Oh yeah. Yeah. Glee. <laughs> like, just <laughs> As a little girl, what are you talking about? I still do this. Yes. <laughs> oh, so when you when you grew up from being a little now. girl, you, 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 you came. now 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 you you still this have is, those little habits. This is America. <laughs> it is. <laughs> oh man. Um, so I, I also actually looked up some. There's a there's one myth that all poisonous mushrooms have bright colors. Oh, I get that. At the market, two yeah. people will say that. And, and it's then we, like, we have the golds and the pinks. <laughs> Look at the table here. What are you? Right. Yeah. And the Uh-oh. blues. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Chestnuts, too. I mean, that's a... Yeah. Have, get you, like have a you guys heard the, the penny one? Mm-mm. Like, if you put... Um, something about if you put a penny in your mouth and you're tasting mushrooms, it'll tell... Like, it, somehow it'll... It'll tell you whether... And I don't even remember. Some old-timer was trying to tell me at the farmer's market one time, and I was like... Dude, do, do, you do not want to do that. That's not how you tell poisonous mushrooms. Nope. I mean, no. You're likely to get something else from sucking on a penny. Well, that's like. fair enough, too, yeah. <laughs> Pennies are pretty dirty. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's oh. not good. Uh, the mis- this misconception about white buttons, portobello, baby bella, etc., or that they all taste different from uh, fallen pine mushrooms. Wait, is Anoki or is destroying angel? Wait, what is Angel or what is Cheryl talking about? I'll let you figure that out, Samantha. Yeah. Um, well, I answer the white button portobello, baby bella. They, I mean, they're all the same mushroom. Um, I do think that they grow different strains to maximize harvest or whatever for like yeah. white buttons and, and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, it's all the same agaricus mushroom. Which interestingly enough, I love that like the European Euro- European like main edible mushroom that we grow is another agaricus like the fly agaric or <laughs> okay yeah, you know yeah, like yeah. what's uh do you remember the scientific name um for the uh you know or for the red and white mushroom um muscaria the oh is it agaric agaricus muscaria no oh my gosh you see i'm showing my ignorance here doesn't matter fly agaric yeah. That was perfect timing. Thank you. I switched right to your face right before oh, you did the. Did you really? Yeah, that was perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Samantha. <laughs> Jason said, "Just touching a poisonous mushroom can kill you." Is is a as a myth? Oh, oh. So Cheryl was saying, Anoki and uh, Destroying Angel look exactly alike and are both not bright colored, and that was her point. So that yeah, that's mm. that's actually a very oh. good point. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Wow. It took us I, a while I, to I, it did. I mean, that's, you know. <laughs> sorry, Cheryl. Which is not in my headspace. Especially the destroying angel. I mean, it's it's white and mm-hmm. just yeah, very unassuming, you know. So John also brought up Amanita and Berserkers. Have you heard that myth? Oh, this is the Vikings. I yeah. yeah, I mean, I you might know more about it than I do a little bit. I mean, I I have looked into it a little bit. The the problem is is that we don't Vikings weren't fond of writing stuff down. So and. Most of what is written down about them came a couple hundred years after the Viking Age ended, so we don't actually know much about their shamanistic practices other than the Sami people still have their traditions, So, and we can assume that there was probably some cultural in- interspread there. Um, I totally believe, I mean, having tried like regular cubensis mushrooms, I absolutely believe that you could use that to in a ritualistic sense, but you there's no way you could do that right before a battle to like achieve a berserker state because there's no way I could keep you know yeah 
Not a not a full blown. What about just eating small amounts of it? I could see that. Like a, yeah, I guess so like a to micro. retrain your brain or something. Yeah, to yeah. or even to just, achieve the animal state or. Well, they talk about uh, something I've heard about people like fighters and things using it, like jujitsu, mm-hmm. and then rolling with it and stuff, and make you more creative. Uh, yeah, so that I mean, helps you reach that free flow state. Okay, I can see. A berserk is maybe a fun way of thinking about it, like ah, but maybe it just right. made you a better warrior yeah more i can see that and i mean you would have to really nail down your dosage because something that could be a combat multiplier could very easily turn into a a combat you know division makes me wish they wrote (laughs) stuff down yeah me too (laughs) i mean so i I do know of some writings there's uh somewhere on a pew in byzantium there's something that's like uh oh crap what was his name othium was here or something like that (laughs) You know, so that they tended to do more graffiti art than. <laughs> That's a tag, yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> um, but. Uh, so that's that's. I don't actually know how much of that one's a myth, but like I can see there being some truth to it, for sure. Just like the Santa Claus stuff, I can kind of see there being some truth based into that as well. Oh yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Uh. Okay, I've got one. We, we actually discussed this very slightly. So this is one we, we discussed slightly before we started. But lion's mane is good for your brain. Fact or fiction? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Yeah. Placebo or uh, right. <laughs> controlled study? Yeah. Well, and this is, this is actually interesting because um, as we were just talking about right before we started, you take lion's mane. Yeah. I'd, I'd take lion's mane. Um, I take reishi. I do not. Samantha does not. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's maybe maybe that's why I'm learning Cherokee faster than you. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> oh gosh. Oh, I wish I had gotten that look. Oh man. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> no. I, so. I can't remember how to count to five. No, you're. You, oh yeah? yeah. Do it. Now I'm on the spot and I forgot. <laughs> Shogu. Shogu is one. Mm-hmm. Tali is two. Joey is three. Nuggy is four. Mm-hmm. And. Shkihi? Shkihi. Six, five. Dahoshta. Yeah, okay. Well so done. she's got it. Now I gotta figure out six to ten. <laughs> <laughs> we have a test on that tomorrow, too. And I'm gonna fail. Yeah, we're gonna fail. Um, <clears throat> so John is saying, uh, as far as the Berserker myth, real quick, and then I'll go back to Lion's Mane, um, that the Berserkers believe that they were invulnerable on the Am- Am- Amanita. The Celts often fought <coughs> excuse me, next to naked and were crazy without mushrooms. Okay. I think they were tripping hard even in battle. I can, I mean, I can kind of see that. Like, whenever I take mushrooms, I want to, I clothes come off. So, we admitted earlier that we've also. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she, I was just going to go right over yeah, it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Samantha just, she's laughing so hard because she knows it's true. Like, no. yeah. So, uh, we both did say we've never taken it, mm-hmm. and I, uh, in radical mycology as well, they uh, said a lot of these cultures refer to it as the god mushroom, that it made mm. you feel like god, that it was a distinctly different from cubensis. Okay. So, I did forget about that, and perhaps, yeah, boom, that might... Uh, <laughs> Make you feel invincible and stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, for me, like, I don't know, cubensis makes me feel invincible, but... I tend to get more couch lock than anything. Yeah, no, I'm not so. fighting a battle. No, no, no. I'm on Cubensis. I am on the couch dreaming. So now going back to the lion's mane real quick, though, um, it is interesting to me. Just uh, see, we, we were t- it was a uh, sporadic. Ben Dooling of Sporadic was doing his master's thesis on basically like how amazing lion's mane is for your brain. And in this like whole thesis he's like i mean i'm so excited to be able to prove this point to get the information out there and to be able to because i'm becoming a mushroom farmer you know etc cetera, etc cetera. and then when he did it he was like oh my gosh the science on this is actually really terrible and any results that we have are actually based on in vitro um the studies are all poor number one they're in typically poor poorly represented journals um, the some of the studies had obviously massaged data, and the ones that did show any kind of perhaps decent results were all in vitro. Which, as we were discussing earlier, it's that whole thing of like 
you know, uh, oh, silver kills cancer in vitro. You know what else kills cancer in vitro? A bullet. And that also is not a terribly good way of treating people. So lion's mane is not a good... We don't know. It, it, it actually could be that it's not a myth. I mean, we don't know. Yeah. It's <laughs> just been... It's taken... Well, it seems to me that, you know, the medicinal mushroom kind of trend is just is booming there and you take the uh success of the provable success of something like reishi Mm -hmm. and uh it's fun to slap a tag on any other mushroom and it's also exciting because you said i take it for a reason like i i feel different when i take it i i've got the same thing for like reishi and like i was telling you reishi and cordyceps in particular i can tell when i stop taking it absolutely yeah so i mean i'm it what's exciting is that i think like cheryl said they're doing some some new stuff on it that oh, should, yeah. uh, that's yeah. hopefully being done, yeah, in a in a more promising way. Absolutely, yeah. What what uh, he, he's discussing there, Cheryl was just discussing with us how um, there's a study out talking about how lion's mane mycelium a- actually produces an, a water soluble antibiotic, and when mixed into the substrate for your plants, the soil for your plants, you know, it's it, it's entirely possible that these plants are taking up these water soluble antibiotics and uh, she she um, referenced a specific disease tomato oh i forgot the uh something rot (laughs) but it it actually seemed to effectively protect the plant so and and it's backed up by a, a very good study good science and that's something i would like to see more of is mushrooms moving out more from the myth world though i appreciate the myth world um but to move out of that and move into good signs. Like I would like to see really good studies done on a lot of the stuff. Yeah. So, well, and also just with things like lion's mane, it just some, there's, there's so many issues with all of it too, with, with what you're buying, with just kind of venturing into how to make stuff for my own personal use. Mm. You realize how much stuff out there is probably just not even, not even made in a way that I, you know, I guess it's hard to make, to know exactly how to make it before the science is in, but, right. um, a lot of it is just kind of thrown together very quickly. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, they talk about the grain and things like that. So, right. Yeah. It's, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of different directions to go and we don't like, the problem is there's not been a lot of money or science really thrown at mushrooms yet. Yeah. Um, it's weird because it's like mushrooms have always just been a afterthought of botany for the longest time <laughs> until recently. Yeah, so. absolutely. Um, I do see on here, let's see, who was it? Tim Stewart asked about, and I'll say this before that this is not, I'll, I'm talking about what I do here, but sure. one of the problems with all the extracts, the only thing that seems to be standard is like the dosing. Right. Which, if they're made differently, they're made like there's then not how a lot. Lo- ex- how could the dosing all be exactly the same? And so, for my own personal tinctures uh, to get the benefits that I'm looking for, I'm I take it. It's quite a bit more than like what the tincture, the typical like two mLs a day or something like that. Like I'll just take it multiple times. Yeah, and that's uh. Yeah, I found that. I found it necessary to, to take more to get benefits, so that's something we may find as well. Is that it's it's like an actual increase in the dose, especially if it's grown yeah. on something with a lot of fillers or something like that, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'd be curious with uh, commercial versus um, like wild forage stuff and, mm-hmm. I mean, lots of stuff like that. Absolutely. Now, I will say um, – John was asking, are mushrooms the largest living organism? I used to think so from listening to Paul Stamets, but I've reconsidered that in the light of aspen forest growing from clones sent out underground. That's actually something I've wondered about because uh, quaking aspen, when I was in Colorado, you see like an entire mountainside that's just yellow, like in the fall. Yeah. And it's so gorgeous, number one. But number two, like that's a, that's a single living organism. So it is, I don't know. I mean, there is that, that uh, matte of honey my son it's like two miles across or something yeah like that. it's huge but i don't know i don't know how big aspen forests get and i don't know how big they get as a single organism like how many how many other individual organisms are there um and there, so there's okay there's also an interesting thing because i've wondered how to hold this into my head for the longest time because think about this right 
and we're going off track just a little bit, but you have a dish of mycelium. Okay, all well and good. That is an organism. Now, let's say that you cut that and you make five more dishes out of it, and now you have six dishes. Is that a single organism? Or do you have six different organisms that are now clones of the, or five that are clones of the first one? But the problem is that a clone typically means that it can't re, it cannot rejoin the individual, the original organism. But the, these can. They can grow back and join the original organism. So it's like it doesn't fit cleanly. There is a whole language built around this. I did not know this until I got the book. Um, I think it's called The Fungi. But it's just a, a textbook. You have what's called raiments and genets. And a raiment, each one of those dishes would be a raiment. And they would be, when they're put back together, or they, sorry, each one of those is a raiment individually. But they are considered a genet in totality because they can fuse back together. When one of those becomes old enough that it can't rejoin those, it becomes a completely separate raiment that is no longer a part of the original genet. And it's weird because mycelium is so in flux that at any one moment, a raiment can be in a genet, and then it cannot be in a genet much later. And then it just kind of mixes. So it's like, it's this weird, like, quasi individuality. There, there's, it's, 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 it's weird. You're telling me mushrooms are aliens. Yes, I'm telling you mushrooms are aliens. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, yeah. it's that's a, that's it's, why. It's aliens. <laughs> oh my gosh, can we get a meme of me? Like, here, I'm just going to go, it's aliens. All right, so somebody make a meme of it. Yes, a meme. Discord emoji, <laughs> please. Yes. <laughs> oh my gosh, we need to get Jesse Campbell in here. He makes up tons of emojis. Heck yeah. Um, all right, so going back to the lion's wing because i know that we got way off kilter mm, on that yes and the poor science um i do think that there's going to be more science that comes out and probably backs up some of the benefits i don't think that we know enough because people they want lion's mane because that's what was used in the studies typically but as i was discussing earlier how do we really know that it's lion's mane that we want because there's comb tooth, there's bear's head, and each one of those could be just as potentially medicinal as the as the lion's mane. They or just, more. Or more. They've just not yeah. been studied, yeah. Absolutely. So that was kind of my favorite, or my least favorite of the myths, because I take lion's mane, and I wanted the science to support that. So I'm going to be very bummed if I find out I'm just under the placebo effect this whole time. <laughs> well, that would just show that you're a normal person like everybody else who can yeah. be placeboed. But then what happens? Nothing. Really, nothing. <laughs> nothing bad if yeah. you don't announce it. <laughs> I was going to say, just keep my head out of it. Don't tell me. <laughs> That's exactly right. <laughs> you hear that, Cheryl? <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, gosh. Um, yeah. John Grady also went back on, asked about shared thoughts on oh, Cubensis. I've got some interesting thoughts on that one, yeah, but um, do you... Go ahead. No, let me hear it. You, you don't want to go first? I went first earlier. Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> I just feel like I've been people have been seeing too much of my face. So, um, <laughs> so interestingly enough, I don't know anything about telepathy or you know I'm I know that all the pagan stuff kind of throws people off. Everybody thinks that I'm more new age than what I am, and I have some new ageness about me, but not really. I'm actually a very traditional, conservative kind of person. That said conservative as a person not necessarily conservative as a politician or pol in, in my politics because i actually have some really weird stuff that would the you know the right is not a good home for me the left is not a good home for me etc so going past that i think it's hilarious how you have to just identify yourself going I, through i know right tell us your cubensis so oh, thank you <laughs> yeah, we'll go we'll go back to that so you conservative republican <laughs> right <laughs> thanks <laughs> thanks a lot <laughs> um which, I mean, that's uh, whatever. I'm not going into politics. I hate politics. So, going back into Cubensis. <laughs> look at you, man. Look at, <laughs> you so proud of yourself. Uh. <laughs> but, um, so, my Cubensis story basically goes, I was with a friend. We were out at a park, and we took fresh ones with us, and we ate them. And what was interesting is we, I mean, we did you know, a small ritual beforehand and then took the mushrooms together. 
And then it just started hiking down the trails. But what was interesting, you know how Cubensis kind of, it's like Silicon Valley comes on you like in waves? That's, we were having that, but we were having the waves at the exact same time, which doesn't make sense because everyone's metabolism is, is different. His metabolism I know is much faster than mine. And I, so I don't know why it was in such obviously connected rhythms. It makes me question stuff. And I'm not the kind of person that typically questions my reality, but <laughs> it definitely made me question stuff. And but all, not only that, but like we were we at, at one point, you know, you're we're running, and then we hit couch lock. So we just lay under these trees, and then I was, I was sitting there thinking to myself, I was like, man, look at these branches. They look like some sort of, and I was like, I was telling him, I was like, man, these look, it looks to me like a painting of, and he went like of the Japanese trees, and I was like, yeah. And he's like, yeah, that's exactly what I was thinking. And I was like, oh, that's weird. And then I was just like, whoa. And then I realized at the same time I was going, whoa, as the wave was crashing on me, he was going, you know, and I was like, oh, what happened? And he's like, a wave just hit me. I was like, oh, me too. So it was, it was so weird because we were so in tune together while we were out there and thoughts would just keep coming to us. But it was like each one of us was having the same thought, which I know similar situation under effect, you know, you're going to have similar stimuli, but there was a point where we just like hit we we came across this log and we saw this teeny tiny little jumping spider running down the canyons of the bark and there was these little flies flying and we were watching this thing was literally hunting and stalking this fly we sat there for like an hour and a half i mean it had to have been like an hour and a half watching this thing just hunt through these little valleys um and then it finally pounced and when it pounced it hit and then just jumped right back off and the fly just sat there and kind of like span for a while. And then obviously whenever it started to die, the spider goes after it. And I just remember I had a ve- like a very like profound thought, of course, with that going on. And he said my profound thought out loud immediately. And it's just, I don't know. That's pretty much as, as far as I have, as far as like, we, we didn't sit there and test like, oh, can you guess what card I'm thinking about or anything like that? But it was really, really strange. I, I've, I've definitely had experiences in my life that make me question some of, of my own reality. And that was one of those times. Yeah. So that's my answer. Yeah. That sounds like fun. Right. That, uh, I've had, I've had a lot of experiences like that in, um, mainly with the completing other, you know, having someone say the thought you were thinking. And mm-hmm. I've, I do think a lot of that is, um, I mean, I don't know if there's a difference between it, but it feels a lot more to me like an interconnectedness and le- like shared. It's less like sharing your thoughts back and forth and mer- more like a like, group experience. Almost like you're both the receiving end of some sort uh, of... Exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're tuned into the same broadcast. Or there we whatever, go, yeah, so, exactly. Um, and, I mean, I've yeah, I've had some pretty... Uh, <laughs> just where, like you said, question your reality type of stuff. But I've also noticed it. Um, you know, I've uh, I want to get personal for a second. I've used sure. microdosing to uh, throughout at multiple times in my life to help me with some pretty severe anxiety, and uh, in situations where multiple people are even on a low level yeah. of it. I mean pretty much indiscernible uh i've had the same thing happen almost like you'll be in a conversation and you can look at someone and ask the question and then they'll answer it without you even asking it like you can almost i don't know it's weird i've had experiences like that as well even like you said on lower like microdosing levels which to me is even more interesting because that's when you can kind of pay closer attention to it too. And I mean, you can almost start to toy with it a little <laughs> right, if yeah. you want to test it. And, oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I, so for me, it's, it's, I typically like when I microdose, I use, I, I rarely microdose. And, but when I do, it's usually when I need help with something like getting out of a, a funk that I just exactly cannot get out of by changing my, my surroundings or whatever. Um, but then I use it sometimes to reprogram myself, uh, is what I call it. But it's just like, I hate sweeping, I hate cleaning. So you microdose that day and you kind of like, okay, as you start feeling good, go turn on some music, go sweep, go clean. And the next thing you know, after doing that two or three days, 
and then you just keep the habit going, all of a sudden it becomes a much more pleasant habit. You get to rewire a new feeling to that emotion as the way I, yeah. or to that habit is the way yeah. I look at it. So it's not it's, like, it's not oh. like, it's not like me being a kid anymore where my mom was forcing me to clean. Exactly. It's, it's me just taking on, like, I want a clean environment, take pride in that. You know, I, yeah, but you you have to attach that different feeling to that same thought, that same activity. Yeah. So. Unlearning. That's, Unle- what, that's what I like to call it. I'm yeah. learning like that. Oh, so much in my adult life. Zap Bananigan says it's all patterns and pattern recognition in my eyes. I can see that too. Like I've I've had that same Absolutely, thought. Yeah. yeah. Like yeah. there's, um, there's definitely like we all are experiencing very similar patterns as we go throughout our life. So, I mean, there are some differences, but most of us live in the mainstream culture. Most of us have very similar. But heck, before this, we were talking about common TV shows and, you know, yeah. movies and stuff and quotes that we say. I don't really think that makes it any less interesting no, or no. usable as well. I mean, that that... I mean, fact, that could, would, to me, that would actually feed a little bit more into the common... I don't want to say common consciousness, but like common um, wellspring. Yeah. Like idea, like where... Um, and I think that you see this a lot where you'd like... Uh, the, I feel like the wheel didn't get invented just one time by one guy, right? It was probably a series of people inventing wheels because they came across the similar problem. You know, they it's like ro- wheels didn't come before roads, probably. Isn't there a name but, for this phenomena that like people probably. have been working on? Like the light bulb, there was multiple people all over working on I'm it. I'm sure the, there's a name for it. There's got to be. Yeah. I just I, I lack the. Yeah. The knowledge. <laughs> it's but, cool, though. I mean, that yeah. this kind of, uh, you know, immeasurable stuff. Absolutely. It, well, and it's, yeah, I mean, if I'm, if you, if everybody's walking down the road, right, or a, a flat footpath, all of a sudden the idea of a wheel makes sense. As the wheel makes sense, more people are going to have that idea, more people are going to make the wheel, and then, or like you said, the light bulb. Like, yeah. In, I've got, we've got industry at our disposal, we've got energy sources at our disposal, light bulb makes sense now. Whereas a, like a, a light bulb never would have made sense before that. But now it's like, okay, now that it does, now you're going to see multiple people come up with multiple iterations. And Yeah. No. Uh, John said that where do thoughts come from in the first place? That maybe cubes help you realize a part of you resides outside of your individual physical form. And that Greeks talk about the muse as a source of inspiration. And I... I, I can see that. I, absolutely. I mean, I've yeah. actually... Uh, what is this I had on my computer? A picture oh, the mushroom just stones. Looking, yeah, the mushroom stones. And then here's a picture of Persephone and Demeter holding, checking out each other's mushrooms. I mean, it's all over. So, yeah. 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 And that is, um, I mean, that's kind of a common feeling, I guess. And that's when you talk about being more creative and inspiration and stuff. That, And I, yeah. I feel like Cubensis, uh, or well, really psilocybin, I guess is what we should say, um, yeah. just gets you out of your own way. Like it, like it removes the block to to that wellspring, the muse, yeah, as you might call it. So everyone sees that kind of a little differently, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Whatever it is, I think that's appropriate too. But yeah. uh, one of my favorite. Have you ever read the book, the the War of uh, No, the yeah, the War the of War Art. of Art? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, I love that book. But one of my favorite things is how he talks about you. You can't just the muse doesn't just come upon you. And fill you, you know, you have to court the muse. Exactly. <laughs> and like discipline is how you do that. You sit down every day, you do your work, you know, we do our, you know, show every week at the same time. And maybe one day she'll strike us, you know, so, but like, that, that kind of stuff, like just doing, um, I like how he's always got his little ritual, you know, how he points his cannon. Did you remember that? Like yeah. points it at himself so that yeah. he can be, you know, fill, like shot full of, <laughs> I don't even remember it. Just little stuff like that. I know we've gotten way off the myth conversation, but I actually like it whenever, yeah. I don't know, I like to start off with something and then just kind of just talk. So I'm good with that. Yeah, me too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, the there was this, an experiment showing mice transmitted knowledge of how to navigate through a maze. Oh, shh, dog. Of how to navigate through a maze down through their genetics. Mice who had never seen the maze could eventually navigate perfectly the first place. Uh, time after uh, the first time after their parents had learned the maze, that's interesting. I don't know anything about that, um, but I mean behaviors are very genetic driven, so I can see there being something to that. 
I mean, instincts are. I don't know how finally how how well you can like fine tune that or something, but it'd be interesting to to find out. Yeah, yeah. I've heard of a few of these, like training mice to be able to recognize or do things through different generate or multiple generations, but right. Yeah. Um. And let's see. We've got uh, oh, people are talking about their spectrum of ADHD. Yeah, I'm, I'm. Yeah, we let him out. Thank you. See you in five minutes. I was going to say that I'm sure what it is is Samantha has gotten back with the with Brody. I don't know what it is about Brody, but my those dogs love that boy like crazy. Yeah. My friends are here. Yeah. Um. But yeah. Uh. So I I have ADHD and um. I've always thought that I'm probably somewhere a little bit on the spectrum. I'm not entirely sure, just because I just, uh, social cues don't work for me sometimes. Yeah. I mean, I'd be a little surprised if I, if, <laughs> if, if I wasn't. If yeah. you weren't, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah. A little bit. I mean, but it, uh, I don't know. That's something that I've, I don't know, mushrooms help almost turn that into nothing but a strength. Yeah. It's. I feel like it's done the same for me. It's definitely made me more empath- empathetic. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Like I've. Yeah. It was. Uh, it was definitely something like being. Well, I mean, for one thing, it gives you a sense of other people and that connectedness and stuff. Like, start thinking about like, oh, I'm not just me. I'm everyone. Makes you, you know, start being a little bit more em- empathetic <laughs> and patient with people. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um. So, wait, oh, Tim says there's a huge crossover between ADHD and the spectrum. Yeah, that makes sense to me. It would. But I'm... It's definitely not a superpower, but you can turn it into a strength, I feel like. Balance it out, so... Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so this isn't one of the myths, but how the heck does a contaminated lion's mane block make so much juice? It's like pulling it out of the... It's like pulling it out of the air. I mean, we we've seen this many times. We talked about it, yeah, all the time. Yeah, I, uh, it's magic. Oh yeah, hey, there's Jackie <laughs> in the background. They can't see you waving because the microphone. Oh, sorry. He waved at you guys. Um, yeah, that that stuff. If if it's what I'm thinking, it is like I, I'll, the time that my linesman gets the most like juicy is whenever it gets that black death. Stuff where the, the all the fruits start turning black, that black juice starts running out, it soaks it up. Yeah, it's so gross. But <laughs> and it smells. It smells. I mean, yeah, I uh, in my smaller basement op, I literally just have to walk down the stairs, and you go, I, "What is it? It's yep. <laughs> there's, there's a the, bag there's somewhere. There's a bag somewhere. Uh, I hope it's on the bottom." <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! So for a while, we were actually doing we were pr- planting all of our herisium on the bottom shelves. And then we just stopped doing it because yeah. it, it became annoying to have to just grow them there. So. Yeah, screw the rotation up just for the herisiums. Yeah, uh, move them around too many times. We've uh, just started stacking them again, but we've also not suffered from the problem in quite a while. So I imagine that will. <laughs> oh my she, gosh. Yeah, she's got a little. She's got a little quail. Well, just so you know, it's focused on you from out there. So. You definitely made it bigger, but it was the blurry, blurry little thing. Oh my gosh, it's so fat. Oh, that's a rooster. Is it? Yeah, he's. Are oh, you gonna do it? Are you gonna do it? Hold yeah. him up to the microphone. Here you go. <laughs> Come on, man, do it for us. Now you put him on the spot. I know. Now, <laughs> now I put him on the spot. And he won't do it. What's your favorite mushroom myth? All right, Savannah, what's your favorite? Mush- <laughs> oh, you're asking the bird. <laughs> Either or. <laughs> well, you see. Nap time. <laughs> yeah, nap time. He's very sleepy. Um, let's see. Oh, gosh. My audio quake cables caught my arm. Um, a lot of us don't realize we have these predispositions until someone comes along that actually understands it and helps you come with grips with it. A lot is, a lot is choice, but most is predisposition. Um... Yeah, definitely. I was diagnosed with ADHD, but I was never tested for being on the spectrum. I really wonder if I am. Don't want to spend money on it. Right to find- yeah, I feel you there, Cheryl. So it's to me, it's like, plus, it, it wouldn't do me any good to get tested to see if I'm on the spectrum because I already know I have ADHD, and I used to be medicated for it. I've actually found that since I've tripped, 
I don't need it as much. Um, but I also take uh, niacin. I take a niacin supplement every day because yeah. I read a report where they were talking about how ADHD is, is literally just a temporary uh, stoppage of blood flow to the brain for like a microsecond. So you just kind of interrupt your thoughts randomly. And with that, niacin is a uh, vasodilator, and so it increases your blood flow. So they were literally just giving these 12-year-old kids niacin tablets and like, oh, they didn't have ADD. So interesting. They're performing better wow. in school on just niacin. Yeah. And you can get niacin from beets and steak and other types of food. So Yeah. Heck yeah. Man, B vitamins. That's not profitable. No. No, it is not profitable. <laughs> it's probably why that study's not gone anywhere and however long it's been, you know, out and about. So, yeah, that's cool though. Um, it's nice. And yeah, ni- nice. And it helped me big time. Like, I feel like I can focus if I don't like, if I run out of nice and for a day or two, I come in and it's like brain fog, just complete and total brain fog. So, heck yeah. So Tim oh. said that we should ask him what the ultimate question to the ultimate answer is. Well, we already <laughs> know that though. It's 42. <laughs> Well, no, I'm sorry. That's the that's the answer to life, the universe, and everything. <laughs> so, yes, yeah, Scott said 42. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Well, all right, Samantha, you got any more mushroom myths you want to share? No, you're more interested in the birdie. Yep. How about biodegradable mushroom bags? <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, oh, do you want to yes. start a war with unicorns? <laughs> oh. I didn't name names. <laughs> 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 Fair enough. Um, okay, let's do this. Bio, there are no biodegradable mushroom bags on the market, period. There are oxodegradable bags, period. Yeah. Like, I don't you know. You need that other magic a... mushroom to come along after and fix the, <laughs> the oh, mess yeah, that we've made. Pelistosis uh, or whatever. I can't remember that. Good sudden, luck. But yeah. Yeah, it's. So the, one of the interesting things is I, I, I actually sent. Um, the information about the biodegradable bags to some chemists in Austria and had them, um, I didn't have them, I asked them to, and they very nicely, um, <laughs> like, yeah, I didn't be like, you know, yeah. no, they, I just asked them if they would be like, hey, are these really biodegradable? And they came back to me and they're like, uh, no, this is banned in Europe because it is not biodegradable, it is oxodegradable, and it breaks down into further microplastics. And I was like, oh, but he was saying... The, the the I saw that Unicorn was saying that they have um, bags that break down into ever smaller pieces of plastic that eventually get so small that a bacterium can eat it, right? Can take it within itself. And he's like, that's exactly what you don't want. That's called microplastics. The base of the food chain is bacteria. And then it goes up from there. He's like, that is not biodegradable. That is a lie. That is oxodegradable. So... And I was like, okay, well, have my answer from a chemist and someone who's not, someone who's not trying to sell me bags. Yeah. So. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> plus, plus the bags suck. Yeah, I haven't actually even. I've haven't tried them. I've just followed. I've talked to you and followed. You know, results and things yeah. on other. And it just it's one you know, of those. You know why Mushroom Media Online doesn't sell them? Because they literally sit in the warehouse and degrade. Uh, <laughs> they, they they can't sell them fast enough, and they they like well they they'll get to a customer and they'll just fall yeah. apart. So, just I don't know. I mean, like many things out there, good idea, right? <laughs> oh my gosh, I want it. I want it so bad. We all do. Yeah, that's like, one. I want that to be as true as lions. Oh my gosh, me too. So <laughs> the one of the my least favorite things, and I I hate it because I'm on their side, is when I make a post of like my, my grow room and people are just like. Look at all the plastic. Shouldn't you be doing some sort of farming that's more sustainable? Well, it ain't going to get more sustainable until we bring enough money into this to basically make some chemical company go, oh, making mushroom to bags that are biodegradable are worth it. It's worth it. Yeah. And so, yeah, I hate the plastic usage too. I know Josiah hates the plastic usage. Oh, it's, yes. It's not something we're happy with or proud of or anything else, but it beats every other alternative that we've got. If you want a mushroom farm. Yeah. So, and we, we actually send our bags off to be recycled. I don't know about you guys. Yeah. We, uh, we do what we can with yeah. the ones that your place seems to be a little more accepting here. Yeah. We, uh, we do what we can if they get to a certain point though there. Yeah. There's just not, it's that. not a lot you can do. 
Yeah, we we take ours. Um, we just put them in the recycling bin. Yeah, they go off. Um, there's organic matter on it. They they don't have a problem with okay. it as it is. Yeah. Um. Uh, yeah, I mean, the microplastic bags are. I mean, like you know, regular unicorn bags will break apart in the sun. Like, out in the, like do not leave a pile out in your yard for very long at all, or you will end up with sh- shards of plastic everywhere. Uh, everywhere, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I've definitely had that problem. <laughs> <laughs> I have finally got my compost being hauled off, so now I don't have to deal with hey, bags or congratulations. anything. Congratulations! Heck yeah! But I've got block mountain in the back that uh definitely got to be like a thousand blocks big through the winter and we're like taking chipping away at it each week a little bit i feel you there Uh, oh gosh i feel you there yeah oh yeah john stamos asks why not tubs you wanna you take that one why not tubs i because i'll 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 be offensive if i answer so (laughs) i mean it's it labor is the most expensive thing there and tubs are just going to there's no way they're expensive to buy that many and start. Plus it's ultimately going to be just as bad for bags. By the time you get done, the tubs only are going to last so long being autoclaved and things like that. And just, if it's still made of plastic, it's still going to be an issue. So um, oh, well said that was <laughs> very succinct and not offensive at all. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> My answer was going to be because they suck. Because they suck. Because they suck. Uh, I hate yeah. every time I see that freaking Norse 4 mono tub commercial, I want to punch a wall. I hate, uh, hate mono tubs. Yeah. So I've been thinking a lot on So Cheryl and I have been talking about making paper out of spit mushroom blocks. And um, I'm picking up scraps from restaurants as well as used paper in menus and things like that that they go through. And um, taking that and and kind of combining them together. And then we've been um, kind of just trying to come up with with ways to, you know, how could we use that as business cards? How could we use it as material that we send in with packages? And something that I thought of that would be really cool, Cheryl mentioned um, making our own little market baskets, you know, and selling those. And I thought that would be super cool. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, well, why stop there? You well, know, actually, could we Cheryl, make Cheryl our own said, bags? Uh, bags, right? right? Cheryl even said in here, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make biodegradable bags out of spent mushroom substrate. Did she? Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, she did. Yep. <laughs> yep. She, she is really on to that, which I actually, I love the idea of growing your containers to grow mushrooms in like that, that yeah. is just yeah. so freaking exciting. it's perfect yeah well and if you're it, taking the spent mushroom blocks right it's it's gotten a lot of the nutrients out already mm-hmm. and if you are taking that and you're molding it into something that you can then put new substrate in it's kind of nutrient void right so would that you know how would that survive a cook i don't know but we're going to try it and we're going to play and experiment and cheryl is gung-ho so <laughs> yeah, you <yeah>. know <laughs> oh and well, cheryl brought up another uh, tub that said it's hard to crush and shake tubs yeah so it's really hard to spawn and yeah and that is true but i don't know i was even just thinking about your your solution may not be something that necess- it doesn't have to be something that could be shaken i would see it could even just be like a container of some sort that is a one-time use yep. that with some of your new multi-inoculation ways and things like that that you can get stuff fast enough where you don't need to shake it i don't know yeah i'm excited for that me too i'm really excited for it and then it kind of going the opposite effect of you know what Ecovative does, right? Where they kind of you know they shape it and they put it in molds and then they they kill it essentially to where it could be packaging material. Um, I would be curious to see if we could get it to still live. Uh, we had an old friend reach out to us and um, he was joining a Mars analog mission, and he cited that he wanted us to be a part of the research in that and one of the things was is you know building living packaging that could be your first fruits to to mars you know and well, anyway really um and how neat would that be and then giving yourself these you know the secondary crop that you could grow off of the waste product of the first and i, w- I know we were talking about myths but we also mentioned earlier about going into you know the truths that you can believe in, and the sense of ingenuity that you you have. You can you can believe in that. You can believe in testing and results, and mm. you know seeing how far you can go. So I don't know. I get excited about these things. <laughs> like, anyway, 
somebody else talk. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, okay. I, I get it. So they're, they're in the chat. There are people continuing the uh, tub conversation. Yes. And it's um, it's very interesting because there's, uh, oh, gosh, there's even projects out there using mushrooms to build boats, faux leather, coffins. John Grady also brings up the, it was actually a canoe instead. It's called the Myco Canoe. I think it was actually maybe the Myco Canoe or something like that. I don't I remember. I thought that was so you know, cool. Was oh, yeah. It, oh, man. I, uh, Kate the Enigma on Instagram is the one that did that. Yeah. She's also doing. And she, she um, paired with a, a fellow. To she do did. It. I can't I, remember his name. Uh, I don't remember. Um, but it she one of the things I'm most excited about, because I think a Myco Canoe is not really necessary or needed, even though it's super cool. Um. I, so Ben, my business partner, who, who you all know, of course, or I guess all you know, too, but <coughs> he is so against Myco materials. He thinks they're the worst thing in the world, their worst idea. He's like, they will never, ever get to the level of productivity that machine-based stuff will do. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. But I think there are certain case uses that it is really nice, and I think she's got a project that she's using, which is Mason Bee Houses. They naturally live in decaying wood. Okay. As we all know by now, if it's decaying wood, that means it's mushroom-infused wood, which I think probably there's probably a, an aspect of the fungal nature of the wood that the bees will appreciate as well. And she's she's got these their little hexagon houses with the holes pre-drilled in the mold, and it's perfect. Like they're they're beautiful, and they will biodegrade over time. And I, I think that that's a really good case usage of, you know, something that's going to go in the garden. You don't want to put plastic in your garden. You don't want plastic bee houses. You could do, most, I've seen other people do wood. <clears throat> and that might be nice and all, but these will degrade much faster than like a regular just log will or something. But that's a good case usage. Another good case usage, in my opinion, is Mars. If you're going to space, what's the one thing you don't really have a lot of? Space. <laughs> I mean, which, I mean, you got a lot of space, but a lot of, like, treated space. And so you don't want to come up with a specialized machine for making every component that you're going to have. In fact, what I told Ben was you take a bunch of high-powered lasers up there um, to cut stone, and you make stone tools. You know, if you got stone wrenches and things like that, like you're not that way you're not going to carry all the metals and stuff. If one of them breaks, who cares? You just laser a new one. And it's, it's going to, you know, there's definitely some limitations there, but you're going to be using high tech, high space age tech to be making stone age technology, which I love the idea of. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. There's something beautiful about that. Oh, yeah. Going back to our roots, man. <laughs> Human in a, humans and their sticks. That's, that's really like, that's, a, that's all we are. But just little stick monkeys. But, um, and then the other idea of this is you have large amounts of like warehouse space. You have one machine one specialized machine for making molds, right? Like a 3D printer style kind of thing. And then you print out your molds, you make it custom right there because you got the machine. It spits out all these molds. Now you can do 6,000 units of whatever that's got to grow in. And now you don't have all of this warehouse space that's dedicated to specialized machines. You've got one high-tech piece of equipment or two or backups or whatever. And then you just manufacture based on the bio load that you've got available. Now you make your, now you're not taking spoons and cups and forks, all that stuff with you. You're making a styrofoam bowl out of mushroom mycelium. You're making a styrofoam fork. It all goes into the, as mushroom food into the recyclers yep. and just like from the expanse, um, you know, all that stuff. So that, yeah. that's the kind of stuff that excites me when it comes to micro materials. Gotcha. So you're just ahead. I is am. All. That's yeah. That's really what it is. Yeah. yeah. yeah I hear you. I like that. I mean, you're, no, your guys' space idea, I mean, for this packing stuff is phenomenal. I'm excited for it. Well, yeah, you know. I mean, it I'm does. I'm excited for when it happens is me too. what I'm saying. And especially <laughs> since what, uh, oh, man, the, there's a bunch of scientists that just released some information saying that the world's going to run out of food in like 27 years, which, I mean, I don't believe in the Malthusiast kind of stuff anyways, but Space Daddy better work quick. <laughs> <laughs> space daddy yes. space daddy that's what Cheryl calls Elon <laughs> yeah yeah. I'm, I bet we can give that hypothesis a run for its money what do you think guys <laughs> I think so so he, he says uh, John says what if your laser breaks well that's why you would you would take spare laser parts I mean that's that's the whole idea is that you would take 
you could take one machine and a bunch of spares. If you had to take 50 machines and spares for all 50 machines, that you now you're in trouble. Like I can even see yeah. you making like faux leather patches to like seal dome cracks and stuff, you know. I don't know. It's just yeah. I mean, that's essentially what they pull out in their little kit in the expanse. Right, yeah. They you throw a tray over the hole until they can get their little <laughs> Band-Aid. Put the, the tray on, a little goo. Yeah. You're good to go. There you go. <laughs> Someone get me the mushroom goo. The mushroom goo. <laughs> I like it. Samantha, you were deep in... You just got like a look on your face like you got real excited about something. Uh, or is it just I your hands? I was just reading. Oh, okay. That, that's Samantha's reading, reading face. responding to, to some things. I'm sorry. <laughs> I do go into the zone. <laughs> That's for uh, sure. Can someone answer the packing question? Oh, blowout in bags. Okay. So if you're having blowouts in your grains bond bags and pressure cooker, excuse mm. me, I don't have a cough button. <coughs> <coughs> I need to program one. You're authentic. <laughs> I am. And raw. Um, you want to take the bag question? Yeah, this was a journey for me, actually, because uh, I, I dealt with blowouts for a long time. Um, the biggest issue for me was uh, I was – it was too hot. I was heating it up way too quick. I was overpowering it on my stove, and that may not be the issue for, uh, for everyone, but I try to v- – quite a large number of things, and uh, that was eventually what solved it. Okay. Yeah, so – I, too, had blowouts. Um, back I mean, day. assuming, again, it's hard to know if you don't see how you're folding it and, uh, so, right. and how you're stacking it in there and stuff like that. It's easier to kind of show on a video exactly how I've achieved success with it. But The, the way for me that, was really just to go a little slower on the uh, heat the ramp up. up. That, exactly, and, that's and, where I was roasting. And slower on the, on the, sides, on the yeah. cooling side. Okay. Ba- bags are – bag blowouts to me, from what I've seen, are typically from – rapid changes in pressure and the bags change in pressure slower than the cooker does so you can't just like rip the weight off or do a rapid cool down in fact that's uh, paul stamets talks about putting a towel over the vent a wet towel Mm. that's actually part of the reason why he talks about that is because you want to slow down the the rate of change and that's really what it comes out for me is if i was cooking grain spawn i never opened it until the next day you know, I, I, I cooked it really slow. I, I didn't, if I tried to stack multiple runs in a day, I found myself rushing through them and blowing bags out. So Yeah. Yeah. I share that as well. It I was, uh, it, today's grain day. Oh, yeah. Aaron's always dealing with the end of the pressure cooker as I leave. I'm on my way here telling her, oh, eh, the alarm went off. Did, please turn please, it please off. Make sure it's <laughs> yeah, please on. double check. I mean, uh, but oh, that's uh, both. Of I those can things, empathize right? with that, and and Erin, you're you're an amazing woman. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, true. Samantha used to always cover it for me, <laughs> yeah. and she'd be like, "Okay, what do I got to do?" And I'm like, uh, "Here's the, here's these things," and she's like, "Can you write that down?" <laughs> I don't even know. <laughs> like what? She's like, "What are the steps to this?" Uh, now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know it. <laughs> if I'm if I was doing it, I could do it, but I. I can't remember to show you, so. Oh, man. And I'm someone who likes concrete instructions. Exactly. That oh, is gosh, Aaron yeah. as well. She wants, yeah. can you write this down? And it's like, I. I want to miss something, especially if I'm not the, you know, I'm not the one that's used to it. Yeah. But. And John, I, I feel you. You said, man, they said we're going to run out of food like 50 years ago. Life finds a way. New solutions to new problems. That's why we need more creative problem solving uh, people, not less. And I, I agree with you. That's. That's kind of my stance on it as well. Yeah. It and is. that's fear mongering that directly stifles creativity. No, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like, so I am at my least creative when I am at my most conspiratorial. <laughs> when there I'm going go. down that. Because, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you get the fear like you're talking uh-huh. about. And that fear makes you go into, uh, oh, crap, what do we call it? The poverty mindset. With Spam and I always, are always with the scarcity, scarcity mindset. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I was actually trying to say. And that scarcity mindset, it's like, Okay, now you got a hoard and everything else and set up. No, like, man, just humans are meant to flow. We're meant to just keep on going. Like, yeah. don't don't be, don't buy into the fear. Yeah, you so. and your problems aren't that special. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, <laughs> it's, <laughs> yeah, that's that's and with that, <laughs> I think the show's over because that's gr- that's a great advice to end the show on. You and your problems are aren't really that. Would you put it? I said special. That special. <laughs> Remember that.
<laughs> well, Samantha, you want to sign us off? Sure. Thank you, guys. We really appreciate you. Keep spawning culture. I keep spawning culture, guys. Oh, oh, oh.